Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to Greenlining Institute's Virtual Economic Summit. You are in the Health Equity Breakout session. I really appreciate you all taking the time to join today. And we're gonna get started in just a couple of minutes. My name is Kelsey Lyles and I'm currently leading the Health Equity Program at Greenlining and I'll be your host for this conversation. At Greenlining, we promote racial and economic justice policies. And this work feels more important now than ever as our state is working to respond to the very real health and economic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. In a moment, you will hear from three guest speakers about how we can center and prioritize the needs of the most vulnerable in our state's health policy response. When we think about key social determinants of health, like affordable housing access, gainful employment, or even contact with the justice system, we know that structural racism impacts communities of color and that we need timely policy response to correct and prevent harm. For many families, the COVID-19 crisis has exacerbated poor health outcomes for folks that have pre-existing health conditions, are essential workers, or don't have access to quality health care. Data from our state's public health department in particular shows that Black and Latinx families are unfairly disproportionately negatively impacted. Today we will have a conversation about the urgency of creating policy and systems change with a racial justice lens and how <clears throat> centering the most vulnerable in immigration and decarceration policy are examples of critical public health priorities. We're so pleased and really fortunate today to have three presenters. They are Phoebe Abramowitz from Health Access, Dominique Nong from the California Children's Defense Fund, and we'll also be joined by Assemblymember Rob Bonta as well. Each presenter is going to take about 12 minutes to inform us on their issue area. And although we won't have the capacity to do question and answer in live time during this time, the presenters will leave their contact information in the chat so that we can stay in contact and follow up. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm really excited to speak with you all today. Uh, for our first presenter, which will be Phoebe, um, so Phoebe, we know that expanding access to healthcare is really critical at this time. And one initiative that Greenlining was excited to support was the expansion of Medi-Cal to undocumented elders. And we were really disappointed to see that that proposal was with, withdrawn from the May revise of the budget. Uh, we would love to turn things over to you now so that you can share with us really what is the core mission of the Health for Elders proposal and what has been the impact of COVID-19 on our immigrant communities? Great. Thank you, Kelsey, and thank you for the introduction. Please let me know if at any point my voice tech isn't coming through correctly. Um, so to start out, you know, as she said, my name is Phoebe Abramowitz, and I would first, I'll get into the Health for All campaign. I'd like to first give everyone context about um, Health Access, the organization I work for. Um, and so Health Access is the Consumer Advocacy Coalition for Healthcare in California. So that means we try to lead on a number of issues, um, but basically to expand access to quality, affordable healthcare for everyone in California. Um, so that is our goal. It has a lot of different parts to it, and we work on a lot of different things. Um, but all of the things we work on are with the goal of expanding coverage and getting to the end goal of a comprehensive health reform that leads to healthcare for everyone. Um, in California and in the United States. Um, so that being the broader context of our work at Health Access, the main campaign I work on and the main campaign that I am here to talk to you about today is the Health for All campaign. And so the Health for All campaign was incepted with a singular goal of expanding access to full scope Medi-Cal, regardless of immigration status, to everyone in California. Um, and so right now, or in the past, Full scope Medi-Cal was not accessible to people without documentation status. And people who were undocumented were also explicitly barred from even purchasing health insurance under the Affordable Care Act, which in California looks like covered California. 
um, just as undocumented people across this country are barred from accessing Medicaid, which in California is Medi-Cal. Um, so even if people are low income and should qualify for access to comprehensive medical care, which is offered under Medi-Cal because it is comprehensive, they're barred from that explicitly in the law. And so the Health for All Coalition, which was founded to um, kind of escalate existing calls within the immigrant community for this um, issue measure to happen. Um, so the campaign is co-sponsored by Health Access and the California Immigrant Policy Center, again, existing in that intersection of access to health care and immigrant rights. And then the coalition is really, really broad. It includes more than 75 organizations who are leading this issue in their communities. It includes immigrant rights organizations, it includes solidarity organizations, access to healthcare organizations, community organizations, medical providers. Um, it's a really big, broad coalition that a lot of people are participating in and I'm really grateful to be a part of. Um, so starting out in 2015, our first big win was to get coverage for all children up to age 18, regardless of documentation status. Um, and that was a really big first step um, to getting the state of California to acknowledge that all people deserve access to health care regardless of where they were born. So then four years later, last year, our campaign won coverage for young adults in the state budget. And so that was only just implemented in January 2020 of this year. But now young adults up to age 26, regardless of status, can access Medi-Cal. Um, and so from there, the next like very clear call from the community and our campaign was to cover seniors. So that's people age 65 plus. Um, and again, this was a very clear call from young people within our campaign and within the community saying, we want our elders to have health care. They have been, elders have been the pillar of the community for decades often, have been working in California and supporting our community and economy for years. And in any time are especially vulnerable to disease and health issues and deserve to age with dignity, again, regardless of status. So that's always true. And that has been the focus of our campaign since we won young adults was to win seniors, keeping in mind the broader goal of covering everyone. Because again, everyone needs access to comprehensive health coverage. And as of now, the only health care coverage that a lot of undocumented people can access in California is like restricted scope Medi-Cal, which is also called emergency Medi-Cal, where you can, um, in an actual emergency situation or a pregnancy um, access Medi-Cal, but it doesn't mean you have access to comprehensive health care by any means. Um, and it's another complicated system of trying to figure out what that entails. So after several months of advocacy last year, we were running both SB 29 uh, by Senator Durazo and AB 4 by Assembly Member Arambula. Um, and in their current inception, they still exist in the legislative houses. SB 29 is to cover all seniors, and AB4 is to cover everyone, keeping in mind, again, that we always have that goal of getting to all as soon as possible, unequivocally. And so we were really happy to see in the January budget that the governor put out to see money to cover seniors under Medi-Cal. So in the January budget proposal, which is like a first draft of the budget that came out in January, we were really excited to see the victory of getting Health for All Seniors in the budget. Um, which is again the state acknowledging how important it is to cover all elders regardless of their status. Um, and what then that means is we were really, really disappointed to see, you know, obviously the big thing that has changed between now and January is the coronavirus pandemic. And we were really, really disappointed to see a week ago today that the governor's May budget revise took out funding for seniors to access mental health. Um, and so I'm going to talk about what we're going to do about that. But first, I want to talk about why that is so concerning and unacceptable. Um, because what I think you all are aware of and what is really the meat of what's going on right now is that undocumented seniors are particularly vulnerable during a pandemic. And it's the absolute worst possible time to ignore their health care. And the fact that it's existing state policy to allow people to die of preventable diseases is absolutely not an excuse to be cutting health care for seniors in the middle of a pandemic when we know that elders and low income elders are especially vulnerable during this pandemic. Um, seniors are more medically fragile in general, and we all know that seniors are in particularly vulnerable um, to dying or having really serious effects from COVID. Um, and we also know that low income people are disproportionately impacted in a lot of ways because of the jobs that low income people work. 
And also with the issues around social distancing and getting transportation to medical visits and other places. Um, and so even compounding on all of that with the excessive burden that low income elderly people are bearing right now is undocumented seniors who again disproportionately work these jobs that support all of California are excluded from many vital services altogether um, and don't have a consistent access to care under the safety net that every Californian should enjoy and that we should strengthen for everyone. Um, something else that I want to posit here is that Health for All Seniors is an essential part of pandemic response. In general, it's again just beyond unacceptable to leave our most vulnerable community members out to dry right now when they're already being disproportionately um, impacted here. And also like the pandemic makes it really clear that all of our health is linked to that of our neighbors and our community members and we can't combat an outbreak while immigrant communities are rightfully hesitant to seek needed care because of the burdens and the exclusions being put on them by the state. Um, so it's we really cannot have a pandemic response without health for all seniors and to talk about it as a cost saving measure is both cruel and inaccurate. Um, so um, the other thing I want to mention is that during this pandemic emergency medical has been expanded to include like testing and treatment just of COVID, but that is in no way a substitution for access to comprehensive medical care. Um, we know that people who have pre existing conditions and especially have untreated pre existing conditions are likely to have worse health outcomes because of COVID. So denying people access to comprehensive medical care and only giving people access to testing and treatment is in no way an acceptable or substantial enough response to COVID and to people's vulnerabilities. Um, in addition to just as we go back to talking about social distancing, there's a, we all know that there's a lot of barriers to accessing healthcare beyond just like exactly what is covered under like this increasingly complicated and difficult to navigate web of safety net that are often put on our most vulnerable people, including undocumented people. Um, so this is just another example of people need consistent access to comprehensive healthcare not like a complicated web of inadequate services um, that are being denied to them, again, explicitly because of where people were born. Um, and undocumented people really prop up California and are our community members, and it's explicit bigotry and exclusion to keep denying them healthcare. Um, so I do wanna be sure we have time to get into what we can do about it, because we can do a lot and we are doing a lot. And I wanna um, bring you all into that because we always need more people um, and so again, our coalition is broad and has been doing a lot in the last couple of months to keep fighting for seniors in the budget. We had an April month of action where we sent um, over 800 emails. We had over a thousand people participate right. in a virtual town. You can see you now. Okay. Um, Thanks. Okay. Thanks a lot. All right. We had more than a thousand people participate in a virtual town hall with a lot of members. Um, and make a lot of calls and emails. And we want to continue that and now escalate that action as we see that Health for All Seniors has been cut out of the May budget because we can still get it into the June budget. So we're demanding that leadership includes Health for All Seniors in the budget and that legislative leadership prioritizes it in their budgets to take back into negotiations. And so we're targeting both legislative leadership and Governor Newsom. And this today is really, really well timed. And I'm really happy to be speaking with you all because tomorrow, we are having car rallies in San Francisco and uh, Los Angeles area and Sacramento um, to target these legislative leaderships and demand that they prioritize putting seniors in the budget and prioritize health care for our elders during a pandemic. It's absolutely unacceptable for the governor's budget to be cutting health care to seniors during a pandemic. And we don't have to roll over and say that that's acceptable. So in tandem with a lot of other advocacy we've been doing, we're having this escalating um, these in-person car rallies tomorrow, they're going to be completely social distance safe. Everyone will be staying in their cars the whole time. We'll be caravanning around the Civic Center in San Francisco or Speaker Rendon's office in Lakewood near LA or the Capitol in Sacramento. We encourage you to put signs on your cars um, and we'll be honking. And again, it will be socially distance safe. And every one of you who shows up will make a substantial difference. The more people we get tomorrow, the louder we'll be able to keep demanding Health for All Seniors. So please, I've put up there a tiny URL, which will take you to a really short form that will just allow us to like send you all the information you would need to participate tomorrow. 
please fill it out. We would love to have you there. I saw that a ton of you were from the Bay Area, so we could hang out in person tomorrow. Um, it'll be great. And if you're from LA or Sacramento, please do join us. It makes a difference. We'll have more information tomorrow and for you if you join about the campaign and about how you can tell other people about it and continue to participate. So please go to that link. I'll also drop it in the chat. We would love to have you join us. And also please feel free to email me if your organization would like to get involved further, if you personally would like more information about anything I've said today, um, or how you could get involved with our campaign's advocacy. We're always doing work for this. And like I said, we have a really broad coalition and we would love to have you be a part of it. Um, I see a question in the chat about vehicle access. That's something that we definitely take really seriously. And normally during any other protest, we would prioritize it being accessible to people who don't have cars. Unfortunately, given the health circumstances and also safety circumstances for people or on people's safety to participate in the protest, both on health and in interaction with police or the law, people are gonna have to be able to be in their cars to participate in this action. So I just wanna acknowledge that I'm sorry that if you're not quarantining with someone with a car, we do ask that people come in their cars kind of for your own safety. Um, but if, if this is in any way accessible to you, please join us. And then if not, we'll, you can still um, sign up and we'll offer you, or you can just email me and I'll offer you all the details about how to amplify it on social media and really be tagging our legislative targets to be sure they can't ignore um, what's going on. So again, thank you so much for letting me talk to you all today. And I'm really grateful um, to be able to talk about Health for All Seniors and its role in um, inequality in um, response to this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Phoebe, for that interview and for raising awareness about this critical issue and the importance of expanding access to coverage for everyone, particularly the undocumented and newcomers to our state. We really want to stand in solidarity, in solidarity with that community. Um, I, I really encourage everyone to check out the information Phoebe shared, and if you can participate in the day of action tomorrow, that would be great. For those of you who just joined us, welcome and welcome Assembly Member Bonta as well to the conversation. So we're having a chat today about the importance of centering race in policy response to the pandemic. And for the example topics that we've chosen to highlight are immigration policy and also decarceration policy as they relate to serving and protecting the most vulnerable low income communities of color. Our next presenter will be Dominique from the California Children's Defense Fund. And Dominique, what this pandemic has done is it's actually, it's kind of elevated the conversation around mass incarceration and it's challenging people to really reimagine what are alternatives to incarceration and how can we invest more in prevention. And so it would be great if you could share a little bit more about how juvenile justice reform is a critical part of the public health conversation and our response during this pandemic. So thank you. I wanna start off by saying how honored I am to be a part of this forum and to be a part of this discussion. So we know that COVID-19, as Kelsey said, put a real spotlight on the issue of youth incarceration and of its dangers. It's because science, current data, and unfortunately past experiences with other um, infectious diseases show that it, there's a greater risk of rapid infectious disease spread within closed, poorly ventilated locked facilities. And we know that the consequences of this higher risk are amplified by folks who, for folks who have certain health conditions, such as asthma, and those conditions are far more common in the incarcerated population than in the general community. And while COVID-19 put a spotlight on the issue of incarceration and its dangers, it changed the color of that light. So it changed the lens with which people view incarceration. So it changed it from a purely crime-related public safety lens. And a public safety lens, that's a term that we've been forced to use that was created by the constructors of the carceral system and the juvenile injustice system. And it's changed it to one about public health, which is a lens that people directly impacted by the system and their allies have been trying to push for some time. And why have we been pushing to adopt this public health framework? Besides general values and principles that we all have, there's some data too. We know that youth who are detained or incarcerated are at increased risk of infectious and chronic disease, are often subject to physical and sexual abuse, and have more than double the suicide rate of their peers. The odds of high school dropout nearly double by first-time arrest, 
and nearly quadruple by first time court appearance. And so it's clear that involvement in the juvenile and justice system, especially incarceration, has a direct impact on health outcomes. And frankly, there's a direct link to racial inequities that lead to disparities in health outcomes that have brought people here today. In Los Angeles, black youth are over six times more likely to be arrested or cited than white youth. Latino youth are 1.8 more times to be arrested and stopped by officers. And this gap persists throughout the various stages of justice system contact. Youth of color are more likely to experience detention, pretrial or incarceration. And the numbers are staggering compared to white youth in LA, black youth are 22 times more likely to be detained pretrial and 26.5 times more likely to be placed in a locked institution or placed on electronic monitoring. And so our current system of surveillance of incarceration have direct links to the identified social determinants of health. Incarceration means family separation. It means your interactions with family members, your supporters in your community are restricted to in-person visits if your family members can are close enough and have the ability to afford transportation. It's limited to phone calls, again, if your family can afford those phone calls because a number of juvenile facilities across the state charge families to be able to speak to their young people inside. And again, sometimes your support network can include, if you're lucky, members from community-based organizations who are allowed to provide services inside the facilities. And then who replaces the support network for young people? They're replaced by probation officers who control your every movement, who have the authority to shackle you, to put your hands on you, to spray you with chemical spray that is far stronger than the pepper spray or mace that we, that we think about. Your home becomes a cell, your neighborhood becomes your unit, your park becomes fenced in rec yards, your trees become bars and barbed wire. Your healthcare access can depend on whether a probation officer at the time believes you when you say that you need access or decides that you're faking. And even when you exit the system, whether it's a facility or the entire system, the collateral consequences of involvement affect barriers to employment, to housing, to education, and of course, then the increased need to address the additional trauma that institutionalization causes. And so how does this new public health lens that COVID has allowed us to really embrace affect our advocacy? So it actually allows us to lean into some seeds that we've planted and actually in some places have sprouted. And these are efforts to create entire new systems that are focused on youth development. So in Los Angeles, the Board of Supervisors actually passed a motion to transition our juvenile justice system out of law enforcement probation system to potentially another agency with the goal, and I quote, of creating a rehabilitative, health-focused, and care-first system. And so they're currently bringing a number of stakeholders from across many sectors to really collaborate. And this is an extension of some successful efforts to really limit completely youth involvement with the justice system and with this concept of diversion, which is really providing helpful interventions at the earliest point of contact that youth have with law enforcement. And so in LA, of course, people brought in the normal justice system players, whether they're public defenders, prosecutors, judges, probation officers, but they also brought in the Department of Mental Health. They brought in the Department of Public Health, Department of Health Services, Department of Children and Family Services, the County Office of Education, Office of Child Protection, as well as advocacy organizations, community-based organizations, and most importantly, youth and families directly impacted by the system. And it, what it, it turned into was actually a creation of a whole new department in LA called the Youth Office of Diversion and Development. And now we have on the state level right now, a big opportunity to really push this public health lens um, with the governor's recent proposal to close uh, the Department of Juvenile Justice Facilities, which is our, our state's youth prison system. Um, and so what does this mean for us? It means that when we need to lean into this new public health framework, it means getting involved in the discussion that everyone's talking about right now, which are budget cuts. Because budget cuts are reflections of our values, they show what we're willing to invest in, and frankly, who we're willing to invest in. And so when we engage with system actors and policymakers, we're really going to push them to adopt a strength-based approach. And I would say not only to just our youth, but also to our entire communities and those who have been marginalized for basically the entire history of the United States. So we tell them to economically invest in our communities. 
We tell them to take an upstream approach to what works to improve the health, well-being, not only of our young people, but of our communities. And that means culturally affirming mentors. It means peer support groups. It means enrichment programs that are in the community, not inside facilities, arts, music, sports, education support, employment opportunities, and most importantly, opportunities that empower our young people to really step into community leadership roles and organizing opportunities. And I hope I can work with all of you. I'll send in my content information as well so that we can engage in some of these budget discussions, which as the assembly member can say, are, are all up in the air right now and, and moving very quickly. Thank you so much, Dominique. That was really powerful. Um, yes, we'd love for you to leave your contact information in the chat and let us know how we can um, participate in budget advocacy and really support these efforts. Um, so our next speaker will be Assembly Member Rob Bonta. And uh, Mr. Bonta, we know that you are part of the Health Committee. You're also, I believe, part of the Alameda County COVID-19 Racial Disparities Task Force. And we'd love to hear from you, you know, how do you, what do you see as the state's role in really addressing some of the racial disparities that we're seeing as the impact of the pandemic? And um, what are you feeling like hopeful and excited about during this time? <laughs> Thank you, Kelsey, and great to be with you, Phoebe and, and Dominique and everyone at Greenlining. What's up, Greenlining and, and partners and, and supporters, uh, thrilled to be part of this conference. Again, I'm Rob Bonta, serving the California State Assembly. I represent Oakland, Alameda, and San Leandro very proudly. I'm in my eighth year in the Assembly, and this really has been a, a year like, like no other. It's, um, it's different in so many ways uh, in terms of how the sort of a, the switch, uh, we, we just switched into a, a, a new crisis management situation. Our budget, which was throwing off record surpluses year after year is now in a $54 billion deficit. We've narrowed our subject matter areas for focus, limiting, limiting, limiting it to COVID-19 response and recovery, which, which actually can be broad within that, um, uh, within that subject matter, and also wildfires and homelessness. Uh, we're having less policy committee hearings, we're having less bills move. My bill load has shrunk. Uh, we're seeing sort of heart-wrenching um, and and gut-wrenching decisions being made around things that clearly were our priorities before COVID-19 still should be. You know, one is what Phoebe was talking about in terms of Medi-Cal for all. That that there, you know, I, I've been a, a really outspoken advocate and supporter of, of that for years. I was really proud when we did Medi-Cal for all kids, and then we had a three-year plan to to cover all undocumented adults as well, starting with our youngest, then our oldest, and filling in the middle. And we just have a, a really different situation right now. Um, having said that, the federal government can be of huge um, support if, if they pass the HEROES Act or something like it, if they negotiate something significant that can really get down to California and help us uh, support some of our programs. But I've been on the health committee and, and chaired the health committee um, over the eight years that, that I've been in the assembly. I've, I'm also really proud to be working with um, Oakland Mayor uh, Libby Schaff and Supervisor Alameda County Supervisor Wilma Chan and Dr. Tony Eiton from the California Endowment on the Racial Disparities Task Force. And, and, and really, well, the way I view this, and I know this is how Greenlining sees the world and, 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 it, and, it, and its allies and supporters and partners, is to just view everything that we're going through from an equity lens, knowing that everyone, uh, knowing that those um, who are our most vulnerable, our most voiceless, are, are going to be hurt first and hurt worst. Um, those who are teetering on the edge or falling over, those who, have, who had already fallen over are, are being hurt even worse. Everything is exacerbated from, from before. Homelessness was a crisis before, it's more now. But yeah, health disparities were a crisis before and an issue before. A lot of folks hadn't focused on it as much before, but now it's being um, uh, revealed uh, for, for, for what it is and, and we're seeing uh, a lot of the challenges there. And so for me, we need to be so supporting our most vulnerable communities first. And, and who are they? There are, there are homeless folks who, when are being asked to shelter in place, have no shelter. When asked to stay at home, have no home. When being asked to wash their hands regularly, have no wash, hand washing stations. So very vulnerable and often in, in, in congregate settings where the spread of COVID uh, is possible. Um, it, it's our undocumented folks who constitute many of our essential workers. We're seeing great pride and, and support for our essential workers and, and seeing who they are, uh, you know, people of color, um, 
uh, undocumented folks. Um, it, it's really important to make sure that they're protected, that they have access to testing, to, to PPE. Um, it's, our, it's our detention centers, both um, civil detention and, and criminal detention. Our jails, our, our prisons, our immigration detention centers where you can't physically distance and, and, and folks can't make decisions that are in the best interest of their health. They're forced to, to, to live with what uh, those who are running that detention center uh, make them do. And often it's, it means exposure to, to COVID-19 and, and, and to um, health outcomes and potentially um, to potentially death. And so you know, th that's how I view our work. And I, I, I am uh, happy that folks in my um, in the Assembly Health Committee and in the Assembly generally are, are fighting for many of these values and, and for, for, for many of these outcomes. I'm really proud that our, our racial disparities task force is uplifting uh, these issues as well. You know, one of the things that, that we see with our federal support and relief is, is a um, is, is that it covers a certain universe of Californians and leaves out a certain universe of Californians. And, and federal support is, is usually not there for our undocumented Californian community. And so it's really incumbent upon us in California to provide the support uh, to our undocumented California neighbors that is not being provided by the, the federal government. And so when um, stimulus checks were being sent out, um, they weren't being sent out to undocumented Californians. And, and so that's why we created the fund, $125 million, uh, a great partnership between the state at $75 million in commitment and, and philanthropy at, at, at another 50. And that was important for a one-time payment, um, but not enough also. It, it was a good start, a good down payment, uh, but we need an ongoing payment to our um, our undocumented California neighbors. And so uh, I've, I've authored a, a letter with others to ask for that ongoing support for our, our, our undocumented community, uh, who of course, again, help um, const or constitute many of our essential workers, also much of our um, our food supply chain. Um, and then, you know, you know we, 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 we do have control over CDCR, the, 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 those are the, meaning the state does. We've, we've taken steps to release Folks earlier who, for example, were within 60 days of being released, got them out, um, and uh, for you know, for if they were in for nonviolent um, convictions and you know, to make them safe, many jails did the same. There's um, uh, low or no bail for many of our uh, in many of our county jails. Um, all important, um, but our our immigration detention centers, um, we have we have. Um, a number of them in the state uh, between um, four pro and, and we have a number of for-profit privately run detention centers and prisons, nine total. And um, they often um, seek to uh, avert the transparency and, and oversight that government run uh, detention centers have. They, they, they don't feel they are subject to, to uh, Freedom of Information Act requests or Public Records Act requests. We don't always know what's happening in there. They don't like to be told what to do. And, um, and then they off, often hide behind um, their partnership with the federal government on the, civil, on the immigration detention side and, and say that state can't ask them or tell them what to do. But we know that we have police powers in the state of California to make sure that our, our people, are, are we, that we protect their health and safety and welfare. And so I've introduced a bill to make sure there's accountability and oversight and enforcement mechanisms to make sure that there is a base level of, of fair and dignified and healthy and safe treatment for our immigrants um, who are in detention in our civil detention centers in California. Um, the um, one other thing I'm working on is, uh, and it started in Alameda County, so I'm super excited about it. It's, it's an it's an innovative approach to healthcare, uh, sort of, um, in short, known as food as medicine, and make, making that a medical benefit, so that. Um, Medi-Cal uh, participants who have an underlying chronic condition like hypertension or obesity or diabetes can actually receive healthy, nutritious foods as uh, as a um, as medicine. Have it paid for. We, we know that we have food deserts, lack of access to nutritious foods. That that lack of access leads to some of these underlying conditions, and that they can really make a difference in outcomes. I think this will help um, with some of the underlying health disparities that we're seeing. 
and um, can really make a difference. I'm working with Supervisor Chan in Alameda County on that and uh, proud of that partnership. And finally, I, I want to end with this. We um, One of the questions was how can can, what can constituents do to help? What can advocates do during this time when uh, the, the, you know, the, the sort of resource pie is shrinking, the subject matter uh, of, of focal points are, are, are shrinking as well? And so the way I look at it is, is, is the following, and I wanted to share this with folks um, who, who are so passionate about the, the change we want to bring uh, now and, and going forward. Sort of f identify what the... Um, um, needle that we need to thread is, and it's this, it's, it's, there's certain subject matter areas being focused on, um, again, COVID-19 recovery and response, um, homelessness and wildfires. So make sure that the ask is as tightly, um, tethered to those priority areas as possible. And so, for example, if you're talking about Medi-Cal for, um, for older adults, you would say, in my view, um, these adults are are in the vulnerable category for COVID nineteen, the category where you know we're protecting most. The, the the reason we've taken all these steps to flatten the curve and and physically distance and shelter in place and stay at home is to protect the vulnerable. Um, and and they don't have health care during a health care um, crisis. And so there is a tight nexus there. Um, it was important before before any of us knew about uh, uh, COVID nineteen. We were talking about the importance of 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 Medi-Cal for all adults, but it's important to frame it in a way that's connected to the current priorities of, of the legislature and the governor. Um, also, uh, always important to be cognizant of the um, limitations we have in resources. So no cost or low cost um, asks are always looked upon as, as more uh, possible. Uh, it, 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 and and realistic. Um, not everything can be. You know, there are investments we need to make in the things we care about. Budgets are a reflection of our values. All that is true. But when it can be no cost or low cost, um, that's always better. And then coalitions, especially coalitions of folks that you might not expect to be in the same coalition, are super powerful. More voices are always better. Uh, having diversity from. Um, Geographically, you know, keep in mind our, our LA uh, county delegation is the biggest legislative delegation that there is. So having L LA support and LA partners is, is always really important. Um, having you know rural and urban, having inland and coastal, having north and south and central, uh, all very important. But then when you have when you see folks asking for something that you don't normally see, or you see everyone unanimously asking for the same thing, and there's a consensus that's worked out from folks who don't always agree, that's super powerful. Um, so there's just some thoughts on how um, advocates can be helpful to us. I always think that uh, what I call the inside-outside game is what we need to get the, the biggest lifts done. That means you, you know, partners, champions, those doing the work on, on the ground every day, um, lifting up their voices, championing an issue, and then working with um, folks on the inside, so to speak, legislators who have a vote and can work with our colleagues to uh, lift an issue together. When, when you have that, that's, that's, that's where the magic happens. And, Almost anything is possible then. So just want to uh, share those opening remarks with you and thank you for, for your partnership. Really appreciate uh, the opportunity to spend some time with you today. Thank you so much for your remarks, Assembly Member Bonta. I definitely agree that inside outside strategy is really important. It's going to take all of us doing our part to create change. And I just have one quick follow up question for you. I'm curious. What are some of the primary um, concerns or issue areas that you're hearing from your constituents right now? Oh, um, sorry. Um, there, there are a range. Um, a, a lot of folks are um, just worried about keeping a roof over their head, paying their mortgage or paying their rent really interested in some of the forbearance that's been um, applied and, and trying to, you know, being able to educate folks on, on how it works and what's available um, has been uh, a, a challenge, but we've, we've done our best to get information out and share with folks. Um, and then they're worried about, you know, after the forbearance ends, when the state of emergency ends, what, what, what is their obligation? Because none of forbearance doesn't mean no payment ever. It means no payment now. And, and, and for someone who is struggling to pay their rent in one month, having three months or four months stacked up is going to be incredibly challenging. So that's one issue. Accessing all of the benefits and understanding what they are and where they come from and whether you're eligible and how you apply has been super 
uh, of great interest. How do you get your stimulus check? Do you do you qualify for a stimulus check? How do you get your EDD? Um, do you are you eligible for UI for unemployment insurance or PUA the pandemic unemployment assistance? Uh, if so, how do you apply? Why is it taking me so long when I apply to EDD? Um, that, that's been a, a question as well. So it you know it's really overnight things change. People lost their jobs. Um, they became financially insecure, or 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 their financial insecurity deepened. Um, how do I get food? Where's the food bank? Um, and and then you know when am I going to get back to be able to get back to work? Is 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 a question as well. And for for parents and and students, uh, am I going to be at home doing distance learning forever, <laughs> or is this going to change? Um, so it, we're in a totally different world, which has impacted almost every part of what we do. Also, you know, what is uh, um, what do these modifications to the stay-at-home order mean? And uh, even with the modifications, is it safe? You know, without a vaccine, without a cure, without a treatment. So, um, you know, people are hurting in in a lot of different ways. Uh, there's been a, such a range of issues, um, and I've been really excited and and proud of of my district and and my colleagues who have uplifted our most vulnerable, our our, our voiceless. I think. You know, we, we, we should be judged by how we take care of the most vulnerable in our community, our, our sick, our poor, our, our seniors, our children, um, those most at risk. And this is an opportunity for, show that, to, for us to show that we, we can live those values. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. I know we are nearing the end of our time during this breakout. I wanted to open the floor back up to both Phoebe and Dominique to see if they had any kind of final reflections or if anything else came up for them throughout this conversation that they wanted to share. Um, sure, yeah, so just, I think a lot of what we've spoken about here is interconnected in that like there's a very clear line between the racism and the anti-immigrant rhetoric and the overlap in that, that leads to folks being explicitly denied healthcare and Obviously, this pandemic is exacerbating that and worsening that and exposing that, but it's not helpless and there is stuff we can do about it. So again, I thank you all for attending this and I hope that you will um, participate in one way or another in your own community or in what we're doing or however you do. Thank you. I just wanted to thank Assemblymember Bonta um, for all the work that you do. Um, but also for the advice um, and just really express my appreciation for everyone here for Greenlining hosting this. I really do hope, you know, that we can take on the assembly members advice, which is really to build very strong, diverse, multi-sector coalitions to really push for what we want. Yes, thank you so much, Dominique, Phoebe, and assembly member Bonta for this conversation. Although we're living in uncertain times. I know I find it really reassuring to know that there's advocates like you all out there working every day. And I think we should collaborate one day on a collective effort that intersects on all these issues. So I will definitely be in touch. <laughs> and to the audience, thank you so much for, for joining. Um, I hope that you will stay active throughout this day. We have afternoon sessions and closing plenary as well. And we will definitely be in touch soon. And as a member Bond said, you could please leave in the chat the best way for folks to contact your office. Um, that would be great as well. But thank you all. I really appreciate you all thank taking you. the time out of your busy day today to be part of Greenlining Summit. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, Take everyone. Care, everyone. Appreciate your partnership. Take care. Bye.